uh, occupied quickly once again. So keep that in your prayers as well. Okay, if you have your thibbles this morning, Matthew chapter 5 is where we'll be uh, parking most of the time this morning. And our title is Christ to Ministries. Christ to Ministries. Um, and we'll see uh, through the through the text this morning that Christ really had two different things he preached on when he came to planet Earth. And we'll be discovering those this morning. Let's open up in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the time we get to spend together, um, encouraging one another, catching up with one another. God, we thank you for the new covenant uh, that you specifically made for us. It was part of your plan all along. God, we thank you that you came to earth to establish it. God, help us to see it uh, for what it is, for who it's for. Help us, Lord, to tell others about it as well. God, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As New Testament believers, we need to know the importance of the dividing line that ushered in God's new way, that is, the new covenant. There was a, a line drawn in a sand that literally said, this, this was the old covenant, draw the line, and now the new covenant. We need to know that, that line, where it was drawn, because if we cross over, there's going to be all kinds of confusion. How we are to relate to God, how we're supposed to interpret the Bible, um, and we can get confused. Is, is this for me, or is this for someone else? Because it seems like it contradicts what God said over here in the New Covenant, but I don't know. What's that, what's that line? Where is that line drawn? And oftentimes it's it's difficult. What I'm here to tell you this morning, it's it's Christ's death is where we draw the line, not Christ's birth. Not Christ's birth. We'll go to Hebrews and we're going to come back to Hebrews and Galatians here in a minute. Was it his birth or was it his death where the new covenant begins? And oftentimes we get them mixed up. We think it's we think it's its birth when it's not his birth. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 through 18, it says this: For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay, so there's the word death, crucifixion in Christ's case. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated. Look at this, without blood. So we know in the, the first uh, covenant, the law of Moses, when he brought down the, the commandments from the mountain and read them to the people, it was consecrated by blood. And they killed animals and literally sprayed the audience, the Israelites, with blood. You weren't walking away without a drop of blood on you. You were going to get really baptized by blood. The second covenant came through the death of Jesus Christ, his death, whereupon we read in our Bibles that he also shed his blood. And every time we take communion, it is a picture of his shed blood, which inaugurated the new covenant. It wasn't his birth. It wasn't his birth. It was his death. But here we see Jesus was born under the law. And he, he came in to planet earth um, under the law to a people that were under the law. We go to Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. We all can say, yes, Jesus was born from a woman. A marriage, he was born from a woman. We tend to forget that he was also born under the law. Born under a woman, the woman was under the law. He was born under the woman, and he was under the law. And he was born to a people that were under the law. What's that a reference to? The old covenant. So his birth did not usher in the new covenant. It was 33 years later when he died that the new covenant began. And the line was drawn, if you will, in the sand. So, just to see if you're listening this morning, 
Um, did it start at his birth with Jesus in a manger, or did it start at his death with Jesus on a cross? Jesus on a cross, amen, his death, his death. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, go to Matthew chapter 1. I said 5, just go back if you're already at 5. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Okay, once you get there, I want you to turn one page back. Maybe for some of you, it's two pages. What does it say in that single page? Just a few words, maybe at the top of it, right before Matthew 1. What does it say? The New Testament. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then in mine, it says printed in red letters. Okay? Um, if we read that, you would assume that the New Covenant begins where? With his birth, right? That's one of the first things we read about is Christ's birth. And a lot of us think, hey, this is the dividing part of my Bible. Therefore, it's also the beginning of the new covenant. And really, all it is is a literary convention. That's all it is. It's not true. The new covenant doesn't begin at Matthew 1 or the four Gospels. It begins at his death, not at the, his birth. So anytime we read, anytime we read the, the Gospels, we're reading prior to the line drawn in the sand. He was born of a woman. The woman was under the law. He was born under the law to a people that were under the law. When he was born, he was still in the old covenant. His death ushered in the new covenant. All right. <clears throat> Baby Jesus was born under that law. Everyone around baby Jesus was still under that law. And there you have it in black and white. We all know Jesus was born of that woman, but oftentimes we forget that he was born under the law. That means that Matthew 1 and all four Gospels in your Bible, <clears throat> that God's new way wasn't present quite yet. Now, he talked about his new way in the Gospels. He was telling them, there will be a day. The time is coming. He was telling them that things are going to change. Things are going to be different. The new way is closely upon us, but it wasn't quite yet. His death started the new covenant. That's when it went into effect. We'll go back to Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to leave it up, but I'm not going to reread it. The divider page tells us Matthew 1 starts the New Testament, but nothing is more than that literary convention. It fails to mention the truth that the cross is the great divide. The great divide in the Bible is the cross. That's where everything changed. We remember this. You remember the crucifixion. You remember the sky turned dark, and the curtain in the temple was ripped in two. That means that there was no longer a median, a no longer a priest necessary. Remember, only the high priest could go behind the curtain and approach the altar where God was, the part of the temple where God dwelt. That curtain tore in half, was laying on the ground. Everyone could now approach God at the death of Christ. They didn't have to go through a priest. The Jewish priesthood ceased to exist. They stopped Sacrificing animals. Everything changed at his death. It was his death, not his birth, that initiated that new covenant, that new testament. The great divide has a huge implication for you and me. For us, how we to read the Bible, how we to interpret the Bible, how we're to apply what the Bible has for us how we interpret it and, and apply it to our lives. So how are we to understand Jesus' teachings? Well, throughout his ministry, he focused on two things. His second ministry involved prophecy of a new way to come. This is what we're under today. His new way talked of how we were going to be free of rules, how we were going to be free of regulations, free freedom from religion. Again, remember, religion is man's way of trying to get to God. 
It was a grace-based system. It was a system where we could call God, Abba, Father, like we just sang this morning, which is interpreted in the tenderest terms, Daddy, Daddy. What a small child calls their parents. I know some adult children that still call their dad, Daddy. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of intimacy. And this wasn't like the old covenant. It was tremble and fear God. Don't ever call him by his by a, a nickname, if you will. But here God is saying, no, there's going to be a time when you're going to call him sweet daddy. It was concepts of light and love and a whole new light. That was his second ministry. A new way to come. Everyone around him be concerning the true spirit of the law. But we cannot ignore his first ministry. An equally important focus on his teachings to show everyone around him concerning the true spirit of the law. This is what he was born into, and this is what he preached on his first ministry. The clearest place to go to see this is in Matthew chapter 5. So go back in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5. We'll be looking through verses 21 through 48, where Jesus literally dropped the mic. And we have this term today, if you really get someone good, it's a mic drop. Well, Jesus dropped the mic multiple times from Matthew chapter 5 to anyone who was willing to listen. So let's run through the highlight reel of Matthew chapter 5, what I would call a killer sermon. Now remember, his first ministry was to explain the true spirit of the law. Not the law as we understood it from Moses, but the spirit of the law behind what Moses gave to the Israelites. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. Listen to this. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay? But I say unto you, and this is where he's explaining the true spirit of the law. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Okay? He took, Thou shalt not murder, and he expanded it. Amen? Wow. All right, next highlight. Uh, verses 27 to 20. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, we understood this is what Moses told us. Don't cheat on your spouse. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Up in the ante. Matthew 5, 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee, for it is probable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Next highlight, verse 30. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Cast it from thee, for it is probable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body shall be cast into hell. Verses 43 and 44. And ye have heard... Then it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you to persecute. One more. And in case that wasn't enough, in case you weren't convinced that this is kind of crazy, he ends it with this. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which in heaven is perfect. Now Christ's fan club was very familiar with the Old Testament teachings of Moses. Those that were listening to this sermon in chapter 5, you know, he came to that first one, thou shalt not murder, and everyone standing around probably felt pretty good. Now, I've, I've never killed anyone. I'm feeling pretty good that I've kept that commandment. And then God goes, or Jesus Christ goes on and says, yeah, don't even get angry with somebody. 
Because if you do, you've killed them in your heart. Some of those guys that were proud started looking around and kind of dropped their hands down and said, I got angry this morning before I even got here. Then they heard, likely thou shalt commit adultery. They heard that a thousand times before. And likely also, maybe they were an upright person able to resist the temptation of looking at the opposite sex in a lustful way. But then Jesus says, if you even look at somebody with lust, you've already committed adultery. It's starting to sink in. How could anyone control a a split second lust impulse. Then he hits them with plucking out their eyes and cutting off body parts, and then the whammy just be perfect, just like God is perfect. Jesus references Moses and then raises the bar. He purposefully makes it impossible for anyone to succeed. That's what he was trying to do with those verses. Just shut people down. You are never going to be able to do this. You're never going to be able to succeed. Notice also that judgment and hell are the rewards for disobeying. That's your reward. That's what you get. Now, some have taught that Matthew 5 is actually a spiritual pathway for Christian growth. Here's your standard, Christians. No, don't be angry at anyone. Never look at somebody with lust. If you do, start cutting off body parts. You will be a better Christian. And I've joked before, if we took this for real, we'd all be amputees in here. And I probably couldn't even, I couldn't even probably preach to you because I would have had to cut my tongue out some of the things that I've said. If we took this literally, that's what would technically have to happen. I see Matthew 5 as a question about our final destination. Will you and I be sons and daughters of God, or will we face judgment and go to hell? Matthew 5.45, I've highlighted for you. You've already read it. This is what he says. He says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Is that going to be your final destination? Or is it going to be in verse 29? That you're going to be cast into hell your whole body. <clears throat> which one? No one who listened to this deadly sermon should survive it. Not one person. Those who don't know where the great divide is start thinking... This is about me. I just need to, to, to stop getting angry, and I need to stop doing uh, impulsive, lustful looks, and I need to stop, and you, you go through all the commandments. Those who don't know where that great divide is feels as though the reason I, I'm not doing well is because I just haven't really given this a good go. I've got to try harder. To be a better Christian and not even put my blinders on when I go out. So I, I'm never tempted. Go through tunnel vision. Right? So, so we only look at what we're supposed to. And we, or, or I can't even go out. I'm just going to stay home and be a hermit and live a holy life. Lock myself in a monastery. Then I won't be tempted. Right. Yeah, that's worked out real well. So that's how some of us do it. We just haven't given our best effort yet. It's up to me. I need to work harder at being a better Christian. Some will say, he really didn't mean that. I was even taught, you should be willing Cut off body parts and pluck out your eyes for Jesus. That's what I was taught at one time, even. Right up to that point where you were ready to sacrifice your own body so that you could be a child of God. So a lot of people then turn around and say, well, he really didn't mean it. 
That take allows us to water down all of Christ's teachings. He really didn't mean it. He was being sarcastic. He was trying to prove a point. Was he? Or did he actually mean it? Jesus, if we take it, that take that Jesus never really meant all the stuff we just read in Matthew 5, if we say he really didn't mean it, that takes away the opportunity for Jesus to be a major roadblock for us. You guys know what a roadblock is, right? You can't get through it. It's, it's, it's so big, something has to change. Or you, you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you can't go around it. It is a true roadblock. If we, if we come to the conclusion Jesus really didn't mean it, it's no longer a roadblock. It becomes a little, a little pebble that we can drive right over. A little bump, 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 that was it. These harsh teachings, this killer sermon becomes a, a little scratch. That's all it is. And we continue to motor down the highway of Christian self-improvement. I just need to get better. I just need to pray more and meditate more and, and be more holy than I have been. But you and I have seen the dividing line of the cross. We don't need to massage Christ's teachings. We don't need to reform it so it's palatable for us. It needs to remain at full strength and a full stop. We can put them in context, all four Gospels, and recognize the two ministries of Christ. First one was to condemn the proud with something unattainable. That's the roadblock. You, you're supposed to look at it and say, I can't do this. This is impossible. That was his first ministry. And the second ministry was to bring the new covenant of grace into existence. So here's my challenge. Go back and read the Gospels again. First ministry isn't your friendly hood neighbor Jesus. It isn't the Fred Rogers copycat of Jesus where everything's wonderful and we're having a great time. He is brutal in exacting perfection from you and me to a point where you are supposed to throw your hands up and say, this is impossible. I can't do this. This is a major stumbling block for me, Jesus. That's what you're supposed to This is the Lord with the sword. Jesus is quoting Moses and then raising the standard. It's Moses 2.0. It's the law on serious steroids. <laughs> what was Christ's motivation? To present the impossible teachings. He did it to show it could never be perfectly obeyed. Sever body parts? Sell everything you have and give it away to the poor? Some even were called snakes by Jesus himself. Upright, holy men in society. Everyone said these are the these are the most righteous in our midst, and Jesus calls them snakes. What were the results of him doing this? The rich man went away sad, for he had great wealth, and the Pharisees went away mad. Mission accomplished. That's what it was supposed to do. Enough has been said. Wrap it up. Put a bow on it. Stick a fork in it. She's done. That's the two ministries of Christ. The one ministry was to prove to everybody that it, you cannot do this. Self-improvement is a sin and an impossibility. When it comes to Christianity, self-improvement is a sin and an impossibility. You can't do this. I'll tell you why in just a moment. The second ministry was to bring in grace. This is where we come in. In 
In sports, Olympics set high standards for the world's greatest athletes. Some of you are Olympic junkies. You love it. You can't wait till the next one comes. Or if you're like me, maybe you watch highlights. Maybe you don't watch anything at all because you don't even know what that sport is or even how to spell it. Or who would dedicate their entire life to becoming the best person in this sport? 2010, British Columbia hosted the Winter Olympics. And there's one event called the Downhill Slalom. I think that's how you say it. Slalom, slalom. Say it again. Slalom. Slalom, thank you. Sounds like a need I get in my Italian market. A pound of that slalom, please. <laughs> I didn't say slalom. I'm sure they got some exotic slalom out there. Anyway, on this particular day in the mountains, uh, 10,000 people gathered to watch this event, and the Olympians were doing some practice runs down the hill. And during the practice runs, I mean, they don't go all out. They're just trying to get a feel of everything and just wake their muscles up, get their muscle memory working right. And in their practice runs, they were approaching speeds of 90 miles an hour on skis. That's not normal. And like competitiveness, 85 miles an hour, which is a big difference, is their typical speed going downhill on two skis. And so the Olympic team, the Olympic committee said, we don't, we don't want anyone dying. Okay, so we're actually going to bring them further down the mountain for the starting point so that they won't be able to reach these breakneck speeds and potentially get hurt. So that's what they did. They brought them further down the mountain and uh, they played their event and, and everyone you know, was able to get down to the bottom, place medals and maybe even broke a record or two. I bring this up because I wanna make a parallel to what Jesus did. In Matthew 5, Jesus takes the starting line for this downhill event and he doesn't move it down the mountain. He moves it to the very top of it. He increases the standards. Now, let's just go back to 2010. If you were one of these champion skiers, and you already almost did 90 miles an hour down the hill in your for fun practice run, and then the committee says, we're actually going to move the starting line further up the mountain, you'd probably your heart would probably skip a beat. And you'd probably say, um, I don't think this is a good idea. In fact, uh, if you thought about it, you probably would say, I forfeit, or you would all rebel against the committee and see if something could be done to get their radical decision reversed. But this is what Jesus did. He took the line, starting line, and said, we're moving to the very top of the mountain. This is what he did for you and me. This is what every spiritual skier could never navigate that course. No one makes it down. No one earns a medal for making the starting line at the top of the mountain. And a surprising twist, Jesus climbs up the mountain by himself. Jesus Christ skis down the mountain in perfect form with zero mistakes. Jesus takes the gold and sets a new record and then he gives us the medal. And he yells to everyone there, everyone present, everyone that's listening, stay off that mountain any attempts to ski down it will bring death. Stay off the mountain. That's what he's told you and me. And what did he give you and me? He gave us the medal. He gave us the medal that says, we've already conquered this mountain. We don't need to go conquer it again. Because if we try, he's already told us, it'll result in sheer death.
no one can survive that mountain except Jesus Almighty. Folks, that mountain will not disappear until heaven and earth disappear with it. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Our Bible is not going to change. The dividing line is not going to change. And not one word out of this, whether it's in the Old or New Covenant, is going to disappear. But what Christ is telling us is stay off that mountain of self-improvement. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't earn God's favor when he's already given it to you. Through his efforts, through his climbing the mountain, through his conquering sin and death. And we should respect that mountain. You guys know what I'm saying? I, I respect the Olympic athletes who have dedicated their lives to doing something. I would never, I've got on a pair of skis and I probably went 35 miles an hour and my heart was flying out of my chest. So much so that I sat down on my butt to try to hit the brakes and it hardly worked. I went down a mountain 35 miles an hour on my rear end. Thank God I was a lot younger. I could heal faster just to stop. I'm like, this is way too fast. And I just sat down and I didn't slow down. Christ is saying, I've already done what you couldn't do. Stay off the mountain. We should respect that mountain. Romans 7, 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. We should look at the law of Moses. We should look at Matthew 5, the way Jesus gave us the spirit of law, and we should respect it and say, you know what? This is from God. This is the heart of God. This, this explains to us how beautiful God is and how holy he is and how set apart he is. If you truly respect the law of God, you won't try to keep it. Can I say that? If you truly respect the law of God, you won't try to keep it. And you will say, Jesus, I couldn't keep it. I'll never be able to keep it. Only you could do it. Putting my trust in you. We should look at that mountain peak with great respect, but we have no business ever trying to ski down it. Amen? I'll finish with two verses from Galatians. Galatians 4.24 Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. You guys remember who? Hagar, right? Or Agar. Hagar, under the law of bondage, why would we want to go up to that mountain and put ourselves into slavery? We'll never keep it anyway. We're not justified by the law, amen? We're justified by faith through Jesus Christ. So get off the law mountain. Don't try to navigate it. Don't try to live it. Galatians 4, 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of of us all. That's grace. That's grace. Christ's two ministries. We need to recognize one was never for us. The second one is exactly for us. Stay off the mountain of the law. You will surely die. Let's stand and pray this morning. Heavenly Father,